This week, we're joined by Matt Allen, a senior solutions engineer from Viavi Solutions. Somehow that tells me we're going to talk about solutions. Uh, we're going to talk about things that Viavi does, and full disclosure, they are a sponsored interview today, but we promise to be nice to them. Uh, we're going to talk in terms of what they do for security, how they put that in the context of compliance, or at least how we're going to make it work in the complex of compliance. We're going to talk about SecOps versus NetOps, all sorts of different frameworks like NIST and, of course, PCI. So join us as we tear down silos and build bridges on Security and Compliance Weekly. This is a Security Weekly production. And now, it's the show that bridges the requirements of regulations, compliance, and privacy with those of security. Your trusted source for complying with various mandates, building effective programs, and current compliance news. It's time for Security and Compliance Weekly. Today's organizations face an evolving set of security threats and continually changing compliance requirements. As your business grows, privacy concerns only multiply and add to a dynamic set of priorities. Today's organizations need to integrate risk, security, and privacy into a cohesive program. Online Business Systems team of seasoned security practitioners work closely with you to assess your security posture, policies, procedures, and technologies providing tailored solutions that are specifically aligned to your business's risk profile and ultimately ensure the protection of your brand. To learn more about online business systems, go to securityweekly.com forward slash online. Welcome to episode 21 of Security and Compliance Weekly, recorded on Tuesday, St. Patrick's Day. That's March 17th. Are you following along at home? 2020. I am your host, Mr. Jeff Mann, coming to you remotely from Pasadena, Maryland, and I believe this is an entirely remote episode today, and maybe for the foreseeable future. Uh, my co-hosts are coming from uh, nearby in Gambrels, Maryland, Mr. Scott Lyons, uh, Mr. Josh Marpet coming from Wilmington, Delaware, and our CEO, Matt Alderman, coming from, let's say, Denver, Colorado. Close enough. Colorado Springs, but I have two virtual pinches for the two in the lower corners, uh, Scott and Josh. It is St. Patrick's so Day. You're not in your green. Aha! I offered we were... green, but the only thing I could find is a rifle sling, and apparently that's inappropriate. I don't know. Yeah, that may not uh, be appropriate. Normally, normally there is green. Thank you very much. And it is in my hat, the Boston Scally hat. Uh, you know, 50 bucks, but... Wow, the construction is crazy, but there is green, and normally I have it on, but just not for recording. Well, okay, we have to wear it okay. at least for a minute for it to count. <laughs> hey, before we jump into it, we got a, a few announcements. Uh, most of our announcements are cancellations, but uh, not everything is canceled. You can register for any of our upcoming webcasts and virtual trainings by visiting securityweekly.com and selecting the webcast slash training dropdown from the top menu bar and then click on registration. In our first virtual training with online business systems, you'll learn how to generate a complex SHA-256 hash password and then use password cracking tools to break it. In our next webcast with Gravwell, we will cut through the marketing buzzwords and teach you about collecting and analyzing logs, logs in hybrid cloud environments. And then uh, Cybersecurity Exchange Day, which was uh, to be hosted by Ocean and the Pell Center, was originally scheduled for Wednesday, March 18th, which is tomorrow, or today if you're listening to it tomorrow, you get the math. Um, it's been postponed, and the new date is still to be determined. So we will uh, inform you as soon as we find out what the new schedule is going to be. Okay, so here we have Matt. Matt is from a company called Viavi. And Viavi does all sorts of cool things that Matt's very excited about. We did our call last week, uh, you know, to talk about what we were going to discuss today. And I can tell you that Matt is very enthusiastic and possibly recovering from COVID-19, although he was never tested. So, Matt, welcome. And we're, we're, we're glad to see that you're on the mend. And we look forward to our conversation today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, I was curious if you wanted to talk about... Uh, the spread of everybody working from home and what that does to the tech industry in general. Uh, have you been hearing much about that? <laughs> you know, 
I I I I I don't want to. I do, and I don't want to talk about it because we could uh, we could have a, <laughs> we could we could dedicate a whole segment to that. Uh, I okay. I I have this knee jerk reaction that while there are legitimate. Uh, uh, concerns, especially from a, a you know security and privacy perspective, especially for people doing telecommuting, working from home that have never done it before. Uh, yeah, that's. I I I I also think that there's a whole you know because I'm press and media and I'm sure most of the other hosts get a lot of the same emails too. It it just seems like there's a whole lot of ambulance chasing going on right now. Uh, opportunistic media opportunities. Uh, yeah, and I'm getting I'm getting sick of them already. I don't know if uh, if others have different opinions. Feel free to dissent from my viewpoint. Well, you, I agree. As a disagree. social experiment. Go ahead, Josh. I agree and disagree, Jeff. I think that, um, yeah, I'm seeing a lot of ambulance chasers, but I think that some of them are giving legitimate content, content that actually is valuable. Uh, you know, how do, uh, I've seen several MSPs talk about how do you scale up your VPN hardware very, very fast because a lot of clients are now asking about it. Uh, right. Some of these are giving good tips and tricks. It's legit. Uh, I see a lot of companies talking about how do we change our policies? What do we need to do to do work from home and make it effective? So there's, there's management, there's uh, soft skills, as well as policy and procedure questions. Uh, I also see yeah. a lot of questions about, uh, you know, can we work from home? I mean, uh, if, if I can name something, Charter got blasted uh, and actually accepted the resignation of the, the guy that, that blasted them for not allowing anybody to work from home. So mm -hmm. that was a fascinating news story right there. Anyway, I'm sorry, yeah. go ahead. Uh, no, I'm a little bit I'm a little bit handicapped because I've been working at home for uh, effectively over 20 years. So I, I I do not begin to claim to be in tune with all the complexities and challenges. Uh, I mean, we talked a little bit of, about it on Paul Security Weekly last week, and and just the aspects of you know, there's certain people that are already accustomed to working remotely and they have company issued laptops and so on and so forth but there's apparently a lot of companies out there that still make people come to an office and uh, don't even necessarily have laptops to give them so now they're faced not only with people working from home but working on what and is it going to be bring your own bring your own laptop bring your own computer bring your own workstation in, in order to to try to you know, keep things going. Um, so I, so I want to turn this on back to Matt for a second. Yes. What's let's. the impact from a network perspective, right? With this remote workforce, right? If you think about a traditional tech company that maybe had a lot of people in the, uh, in the office and you had, you know, uh, the Viavi solution in place, for example, right. And you can monitor all the East, West, North, South traffic. What happens now that you have this large remote population What's some of the impacts to what you guys can and can't do at the network layer? I'm, I'm curious what kind of what you guys are seeing. So that's a great point. So there's, there's a few things uh, from a technical perspective, but there's also a human aspect, which I think is a very interesting part of this story. When I look at my calendar and all the meetings that have been canceled, uh, a lot of them are not just uh, a person that doesn't have a laptop or would have no way in a pinch of, of joining a web call. Uh, what I'm hearing most often is, guys, I'm stuck at home with all my kids. So that's <laughs> number one. They're like, I'm not ready for this. And, it, and then you add on to that. It's like, and they are streaming everything all the time. So this network at my home is not going to be able to handle anything. Can we please just talk, talk later? So you have um, kind of these forced home meetings to where their, their home situation uh, isn't prepared like you know, as already mentioned, I work from home a lot. I have my, you know, area cordoned off. I can keep it quiet. I know my net connection is good. People were not ready for that. But what I hear most of, of what's happening is, uh, was mentioned earlier was the VPN is that, you know, you have a corporate policy that says everybody work from home and everybody join the VPN because we want to maintain our security policies, which is kind of, you know, overall theme of what we're talking about here. And then the VPN chokes because all their employees are following the policy and everyone's kind of looking around going, okay, what do we do now? Um, step number one, it seems to be scale up the VPN. Uh, step number two is the myriad of problems that could happen. And that, that's where monitoring comes in. And whether you're looking at wire data monitoring, um, and, and to be honest, there's 
a lot of uh, data sources and, and, you know, we're dabbling into uh, flow data, machine based data, because what you're going to bump into is less these weird uh, layer seven type call type problems. It's going to be saturation of something you never thought about before because your entire enterprise is using it in, di in a different way. So identifying which bit is saturated, whether it's a, a physical net link, whether it's overrunning the CPU on something, um, getting to those answers fast is, is going to be going to be key to keeping everything going. And for the network bit, just going out to Starbucks, at least in California, no longer an option. So it's right. interesting times for sure. Well, I bet driving up and so, down the 101 is really easy right now in the Bay Area because everybody's, <laughs> nobody's commuting. Thank so, you. Wow. you know, I, thought I bet there are people parked outside of Starbucks <laughs> just to use the Wi-Fi from right outside the door. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, um, I mean, I watch too many zombie movies to begin with, so I, I try not to think about that too much, but it's like, oh well, man, we're getting close. <laughs> it's pretty scary out there. You know, it, it, it's it's really interesting what's going on right now. Uh, companies should be utilizing this period of where people can work at home uh, for sort of a, a, a corporate experiment, if you will, right? Yeah. Not only seeing For if their sure. policies and their procedures are correct, but also making sure that their network monitoring is online, right? Uh, taking a look at how many people, uh, how many people actually do work from home versus the amount of productivity. And a lot of that can be seen by wow. inspecting the network traffic, right, Matt? That's absolutely true. And I'd say uh, one of the big ones is uh, you have all these people logging in from unknown locations. Uh, it is a prime time if I've compromised some credentials to take advantage of that, right? And so trying to determine what's normal, uh, how quickly can I figure out if a login is logging in from China versus Portland? Those kind of questions, um, if you can solve it quickly, are super valuable. If not, you're, you're either going to just let it go and hope it's not a problem, or you're going to be doing some historical research trying to prune through this week that we're going through. Um, and then it goes, okay, we think we might have a problem. What did that machine do? Did he just, you know, use normal tools or did he talk directly to the SQL server for some reason? Um, that's, that's what we're up against. So, Interesting conversation, but if we can back up for just one second, and and uh, you started it, Matt, by asking the this uh, <laughs> hot button question. But uh, who are you, and and what do you do? Who is Viavi? What does Viavi do? Just in case our listening audience is is not uh, not familiar <laughs> with you guys. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so, uh, my name is Matt. I'm a network engineer at heart. Uh, I went through the dot com stuff back in the day. If you remember cable modems and excite at home, uh, I was running their network operations center for a few years, uh, kind of bounced around, got into uh, data backup, um, which was really my exposure to compliance, uh, whether it's, uh, Sarbanes-Oxley, HIPAA, PCI, uh, how you manage your data, how you're able to recover from a disaster really exposed me to that kind of world of compliance. Uh, and then I joined a company called Network Instruments, uh, which is, I, I like to describe it as a packet sniffer on steroids. And what they were doing was just too neat for me to pass up. Um, and then that has evolved into uh, modern day Viavi. So this uh, origin of the packet sniffing technology has been around 25 years, biggest, best, fast at that. Um, but now we're starting to realize uh, that's a great tool to have, but people need several tools in the toolbox, right? And so bringing in able to consume flow data, enrich it in ways that's actually useful with uh, authentication data, LDAP, and all that. And what we were talking about a little earlier is it becomes harder to describe who you compete with when you start adding those type of things, because if we can have our tech talk to the load balancer and consume a log or SD-WAN router or whatever it is, we're consuming logs. So does that mean we compete with Splunk? Mm, the, the answer is not, not really. That's not what we're designed to do. It's not our strength, but there is a portion of log consumption. So this, this kind of goes into uh, the same way you would spot you know, checkbox your PCI compliance and say, I need a product that does this. It does this check. It's getting a lot tougher because products are doing more and more and you need to take a holistic view, whether it's 
performance troubleshooting, your SecOps security stance, or your compliance, can I get several of these checkboxes with one product by understanding really what it can do? Um, and so, yeah, that's uh, overarching. Viavi will consume uh, wire data, whether that's uh, packets, everyone in zero, flow data, VPC logs were mentioned in, a, in an earlier conversation, um, enrich it with SNMP, WMI authentication, all that good stuff, and basically help you troubleshoot performance problems by doing the triage of, is it on the client side? Is it the network? Is it the server? Or is it the application tuning itself? Or um, from a SecOps standpoint, who's using what credentials? What did that machine do? Uh, is anything talking to a known blacklist on the net? Uh, let me fingerprint what server should be doing and just alert me when anything does something unusual, um, which kind of gets into the detection space a little bit. So that's... Yeah. Uh, in a nutshell, yeah. I felt started to started to go down the rambling path there. How, did I answer your question? <laughs> Mostly, it I did. Think, yes. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, that gives us a good overview, I think. Um, and then getting back to the the conversation at hand and some of the challenges we're talking about, which you know, like I said, we're already starting to have these types of conversations. Uh, I I get the impression, and this is just a hunch you know ba you know based on my curmudgeonliness i guess but <laughs> I, I, sus I suspect that if a lot of companies are going to try to maintain some semblance of being able to be productive and and do business that compliance is going out the window first and foremost uh followed by a very close second because uh um uh, some people believe security and compliance are very interrelated, but you know, security in a lot of ways is going to go out the window, which leads to a uh, a question um, that we ask all of our guests: uh, Where do you fall, Matt, personally, sort of on this spectrum, this this continuum between security and compliance? No right or wrong answer, just a level set to help us understand where you're coming from. For the spectrum between security and compliance, are you meaning? Um like uh maybe i should uh, define it a little bit more you, you mean like following up on your internal security policies um in and when they're opposed to your compliance auditing or how do you how do you mean it, it's an open-ended question left to the interpretation of you to the huh. based on your definition and understanding of the oh. terms what's your view of security versus what is my view? you know so so when it comes to compliance, um, this is this is actually okay. Uh, I'll, I'll kind of give you my uh, checkbox example again. And so okay. compliance is great. Um, and and I know you mentioned NIST a little bit earlier. So you have a, a security, a, a massive list where you can do checkboxes and say we're you know doing our due diligence and, and we're covered and we're doing these checkboxes. Um, what that kind of starts to turn into a pitfall is you you have those that are not um understanding from an overarching standpoint uh why those things are there and what it's accomplishing if your goal is just to check a box um instead of understand you know the the thought process behind that box uh it starts you start to believe well as long as we have these boxes checked then we're done and that's that's never true because it's a it's an arms race so i think it's a good, I, the, the CCPA is a great example. And if you look at the language um, that came out with CCPA, it was saying, hey, we were assuming that enterprises were going to do better and do their own due diligence to prevent data breaches from happening. And it's getting worse. So somebody has to step in and do something. And I agree with that, right? Um, the, the problem is that the direction often is not appropriate for every everybody. So it's, you know, it comes down to guidelines, right? So when you have the CCPA and they go, okay, great. We want to treat customers data, uh, in a, you know, in a, in a more reasonable fashion, uh, but no specifics as to, you know, the, the nitty gritty of what is customer data and how do we have to treat it? And what are the penalties for this? It kind of reminds me of putting up a big sign at the top of the street saying, okay, we passed a law. Everybody needs to drive safely. And that's it. And so the interpretation of what is driving safely and what what happens if somebody decides that I don't, 
um, how valuable is that? Um, it's not as valuable as everybody agreeing on, you know, how fast you should go and, and what the, what the penalties are, but to get to that point, we're way, way, way off. So in that sense, I think compliance, uh, to, um, those sort of policies absolutely help strengthen your security stance, but it should not be a substitute for having security expertise that can customize your particular industry. Cause who's attacking you is totally different, right? Some people it's, you're more worried about insider threats, taking your intellectual property outside of the building. Some people, uh, if you look at the example of what happened to Boeing and Airbus, uh, they have nation states going after those blueprints. So your behavior should be totally different and you don't go to just your standard, um, you know, PCI or, you know, any of those compliance things just as saying, well, we're secure because we check the boxes. So does that make sense? They, they work hand in hand, but you gotta, it, it's not a substitute for, for, you know, doing your due diligence for, for your enterprise, for sure. No, absolutely makes sense. And I love the analogy that you brought up. Uh, it's got my mind spinning, uh, uh, about, uh, you know, basic traffic safety and and warning signs yeah. like, uh, uh, you know, the I, I routinely travel on this one particular highway and take an exit that says, you know, the speed limit for this turn is, you know, let's say 35. But I know I can take it at 50, 55. And, and I think that's a <laughs> that's a that's a great example of the letter of the law checking the box. I need to go 35. Otherwise, I'm not being compliant. But the sort of the operational knowledge to know that within the spirit of the uh, of the law it's right. you need to slow down in actually order can to i extend that this turn ah, absolutely, can i extend Josh. that so my father is i don't actually, know uh, can you i think i can <laughs> my father is actually an automotive engineer he was and uh he doesn't do it as much anymore uh and i learned from him a lot uh, about this kind of thing actually do you know how they set speed limits on curves and on roads in general was they would actually watch the cars going by and they would set it at the 80th percentile. So mm -hmm. before the federal government started inter interfering with uh, uh, block grants and saying 55 is the, the standard of, of speed and everything else, uh, it was literally they would watch and just survey all the cars going by and the 80th percentile speed was the one that was deemed as safe. Uh, and actually on most curves, as long as the road is dry, you're safe at about twice the curve, you know, the, the suggested speed, as you said, 35 miles an hour, you're safe at up, about up to 70. If your car's in good repair, has good road handling, and the road is dry, you're probably fine. Not that I recommend this. Please don't do it. I am not a lawyer. <laughs> Dear God, don't kill yourself. <laughs> but uh, Josh said I could take the turn. <laughs> don't do that. But, but that uh, comes down to like the compliance is like, you you have general guidelines for people that are coming in with no information out of town and then yeah, you yeah. have your general driving safety like what is the condition of your car what are the conditions of the road is it bright uh tire inflate there's like too much and so just relying be like well i saw a sign and i did what the sign said it's the same thing with compliance it's like yeah we should all be in compliance but that's not a substitute for understanding like what you should be doing in general. And I think kind of NIST falls, is falling into that too, is people go, look, I just want, I just want a list of boxes. And then I want vendors to come up to me and say, okay, we will help you check box 13, A, B, and C. I have it checked. And then, then I'm done. And that's just not the world we live in anymore. Oh, but, uh, well, again, that's, they're, they're, that's kind hold of, on, hold on. no, they're, no, they're, me they're, first. Cause it's my show. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay, fine. I will defer to you in a moment, but this is, uh, again, it's a great analogy because, I mean, why do we need any kind of road signs or any kind of highway markings at all? If you're really familiar with the road, you don't need it. But all those things exist for those that are unfamiliar with the territory. You know, drive on a road you've never driven before at night in a rainstorm. You really want those lines on the road and you hopefully they, they're going to reflect despite the the level of you know layer of rain that's on the highway. So uh, it's a great analogy. I'm going to steal it and moving forward. Thank you. Uh, now, Scott. Yeah, <laughs> stop using checkbox mentality, period. End of story. Please, for the love of God, stop using checkbox mentality, right? The problem is that it's been so ingrained in our heads that once we, quote, check a box, we don't have to worry about it anymore. 
That's not how compliance works, right? That's not how network monitoring works. That's not how security and the rest of business works, right? Unfortunately, the systemic issue that we're dealing with is the fact that auditors and companies that come in as independent verifiers, right, say, well, if you've done this, 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 and this, check a box. That's not the point here, right? The point is the checkbox is where you start, right? So yeah. a checkbox mentality is actually really detrimental to a business, right? Because you're not going above and beyond with the controls. Now, if you have a solution like Viavi has, right, that gives you that introspective look into all of the traffic circling your environment, right? You're going beyond the checkbox. Use it. Do stuff with the data, right? Am am I wrong in this rant? Matt, Jeff, Matt, I Josh? Think, I think you're I think you're absolutely right. And we've had a a couple of speakers that come in and talk to us uh at Viavi. And um one of them he's he's from the Marines and now he's a cybersec like mm -hmm. instructor. And he talks a lot about threat hunting, where the time of being able to buy a technical solution and then have that mean you were safe are long gone. So there's no, well, if I just found the right tech, then I'm then I'm good and I can go about my day. This is a this is a constant struggle now. And what you should be doing is assuming that the intruders are smarter than your technology and that they've gotten in and you have to theorize, what if, uh, how would I do it? If I did my recon and I knew they were using blah firewalls and blah IDSs and uh, blah routing equipment, blah operating systems, how would I try and weasel my way in? And then you expound your theory and go hunting for them. Without those sort of forensic tools to be able to do that, you can't, right? you're just sitting there waiting for an alert to happen. So as we migrate more towards the, we need to be smarter than the bad guys instead of buy the right tool and then just uh, trust that it's gonna be always smarter than the bad guys, it's an evolving thing. And I think that comes from the checkbox mentality too, is you're like, do you have firewalls? Yes, I have a firewall. And now it's like, oh, well, I need detection. Do I have detection? Yes, I have detection. And uh, this falls into buzzwords. I know the one, at least a couple couple of years ago was machine learning and AI. And they, everybody was throwing in that they had it because somewhere some guy in a blazer was saying at their company, we need to take advantage of AI. And they were trying to check the box without <laughs> even understanding like, is this even appropriate for, for what we're trying to do today? Um, I've seen a lot of that out there. No. Uh, technically, uh, technically, speaking, technically speaking, if your company implores the use of if then else and if statements, you're using machine learning, right? Agreed. Oh. Or at least AI. Agreed. We got AI. I mean, I, I don't push like, back on one thing you said, Matt, and that is the, the belief that uh, that uh, technology solutions, that we've moved beyond the point where technology solutions solve the problem. I, I think that's a misconception from the very beginning. I don't think they've ever uh, accomplished completely what we've looked for them to accomplish. But that's I just think you're right. I think it's gotten worse. Um, I know I I'm right. I'm just humoring you. <laughs> <laughs> you are you are right. Um, the I, I think it started to get bad uh, when virtualization started heating up. Um, and the reason I say that is I started to have more and more conversations with technicians that had projects where they had a deadline and they had to fulfill it, and that project was being pushed by the CFO and not the CTO, and but I, they were going. Comment? But I think there's an, <laughs> yeah I, I think there's an equivalent here uh, between you know sort of the checkbox mentality to to meet in compliance and thus your security requirements and on the yeah. security side it's the idea that if I drop in the right automation and the right tool that I've accomplished security I think both yeah. uh, mindsets are are fall short. Uh, of yeah. an end goal, which re which necessarily requires people that know what they're doing, uh, have the experience of of you know the t the tools, the technology, the network traffic, the application traffic, whatever it is. There's there's no substitution yeah. for humans with real learning and real intelligence. Uh, 
making some sometimes it's a you know i feel it in my gut decision about what they're seeing happening thinking that it's something a little bit off and then investigating it yeah and this comes down to something i was gonna talk to you about which was uh old school network troubleshooting and we had we had a manager that literally for every every problem on the network and, and keep in mind this is like a global size network wanted a binder where you could step through and basically kind of do the troubleshooting script for everything on the network. Um, and, and we were trying to tell him like, this is close to impossible. Um, and no, no, so no, no, much it's totally of it. fine. It's totally, come on, man. You, you, you oh. give me a few million dollars. I'll build out the virtual binders, you know, and all the security <laughs> automation and I'll have it machine it's, learning and, and, and artificially intelligent or something. I don't know. And so they automatically pick the right binder. <laughs> It's and you know more power to you if you can get close, um, but as things grow, the more complex they get, like that becomes next to impossible. And he would get infuriated when I would come and do kind of do a post morning at the end of the week, and I'm like, here's all the problems that were solved, and here's how much people made a decision based on their gut. And if you ever, I don't know how much you guys like read, but if you read um, what's his name, Malcolm Gladwell's book Blink. The yep. gut feeling. I know. I think you mentioned your your curmudgeonly gut was telling you something early in this call. Mm -hmm. That comes from years of experience, and so right. your subconscious is like figuring it out before you can logically describe it to somebody. You look at it, and you're like, "No, nah, the problem's in this router somewhere," and you start right. doing it. And so that sort of human gut instinct, they're trying to code and call it machine learning and AI. But the bad mm -hmm. guys know this and they know what all the triggers are and they and they work their way. So this is still going to come down to a human to human combat. Right. Um, yeah. Yep. And so uh, we need to take a break here for a minute, but hopefully we're setting up uh, our second segment where where you can come back and tell us and maybe perhaps show us a little bit what what Fiavi is doing just to, to sort of try to bridge the gap, if you will, between this belief that. Uh, automation is not going to solve everything, but the necessity that because there's so much data, there's so much traffic, that some amount of automation is required. Uh, and yeah. you know how do you, how do you how do you implement all the automate automation without falling in the trap of we're done because you know fill in yeah. the blank solution is doing it for us. Yeah. Good good enough setup. Perfect. I'll take it. Great. All right, we'll take, a quick, we'll take a quick break and we'll come back with Matt in just a few moments. <laughs> 